for them. Now, I'll explain that in a minute. Now in its 53rd year. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for observing the unified government's masking protocol for indoor events. You read the star this morning over in Missouri. They're about to rebel. They're gonna have a mini riot. Not here. Also, I'd like to welcome the folks who are joining us via online today. I believe this is the first time we have live streamed a congressional forum, and I'm quite certain this will not be the last. I don't know who's on the other end, but use your imagination. <laughs> These are challenging times, and on behalf of the KCK Chamber and the Congressional Forum Board, we want to thank you for your resilience. We are all in this together. Last month, we, host, we hosted Dr. Greg Mosier, who's president of the Kansas City, Kansas Community College. He provided a, yeah. He provided a wonderful and exciting update on the college's plans for its downtown campus. He's here with us today. Dr. Mosier, thanks for your leadership and vision. Please stand and let's give him a, a, another round of applause. Dress like a Wyandotte County boy today. <laughs> I'd also like to thank all the fine folks uh, who are serving us our meal. Please give them a round of applause. I'm Bill Epperheimer. I'm president of the Congressional Forum. Have been for a long time, but I don't know how long. <laughs> Greg, we're going to have to figure that out someday. A um, couple of uh, commercials on Tuesday, August the 31st. I think that's a week from next Tuesday. Uh, the chamber sponsored a mayoral debate. Mayor David Alvey and Mr. Tyrone Garner will debate at Memorial Hall in downtown KCK from 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. The debate will be moderated by Channel 9's Mike Mahoney, who's also been there forever. <laughs> <laughs> the event will be held in person indoors and all masking protocols will be observed. It will also be live streamed. Now let's introduce the people at uh, the head table. To my immediate right is our speaker today, Doug Bach. Hey, Doug. I have a few things to say about him later on. <laughs> Joab Ortiz, Burns and McDonald. There he is. He's the 2021 board chair. And Daniel Silva, president and CEO, Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> to my left is Loretta Columbell, retention specialist with YWEDC. And she happens to be my beautiful wife. <laughs> and Valerie Musset. She's the general manager of Design Mechanical. She's also a former KCK Chamber Board Chair. We have no replacements today, but we shall see if we have guests. If, if you brought a guest today, please stand, identify yourself, and introduce your guest. No guess. Sorry about that. Doug Bach was appointed to the position of county administrator in 2014.
Before his appointment, he served in the position of Deputy County Administrator beginning in 2003. He earned his Master's of Public Administration degree from Kansas State University in May 1990. As County Administrator, Bach directs day-to-day -day operations of the unified government and implements policy as directed by the mayor and board of commissioners. He is responsible for developing and submitting the operating and capital budget for the government annually and providing staff support services to the board of commissions and its committee meetings. His career with Kansas City, Kansas began before consolidation in June 1990. So he's an, he's an old timer. <laughs> that seems like yesterday, but it was a long time ago. Uh, he served as a budget analyst in the Department of Finance, program manager in the Department of Community Development, and again as a budget and fiscal analyst. His career also includes serving five years as an auditor for the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, and two years as the purchasing director and in the position of assistant county administrator. There's probably no one who knows as much about county government in Wyandotte County than Doug Buck. He also maintains a certificate in regional and community planning from Kansas State, a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, a major in Public Administration, and a minor in Communications, all from Fort Hayes State University. Let's give Doug Rock, Doug Bach, a round of applause. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate you having me. Um, as I start, I'm going to have him kick off a video here, and then I'll I'll start talking from after that. We've only shown this video once since we did it, so I'm taking the opportunity to throw it out there to everybody again from when it was originally produced. Momentum. It's been said momentum is built through hard-fought battles and victory. Here in Kansas City, Kansas, and Wyandotte County, we can relate. In 2020. We drove past social and economic challenges to historic growth, enhanced public health and safety, and enriched quality of life and a bright outlook for our future. We built momentum. We understand how business growth benefits all of us. In 2020 alone, the DOT countered economic downturn with $1 billion in new growth and investments, creating 10,000 new jobs on 30 ongoing projects, many paying $15 per hour or more. When COVID-19 struck, UG's quick response distributed $37 million in federal funds locally, including $9 million in direct aid for rent, utilities, and food assistance, not to mention $825,000 in small business grants. 2020 demanded a significant investment in public safety. We met that demand and also opened Fire Station 12. Citywide housing developments help sustain our historic neighborhoods and meet a mixture of housing needs. Sumner Academy's number one ranking in Kansas, sixth in the entire nation, and the Donnelly College expansion make us all especially proud. City parks are now accessible for more people, and even our canine friends. But we didn't stop with amenities and services. We improved the quality of life for all of us. More local shopping and abundant food options, including a mobile grocery, attract families, assist seniors, and keep revenue in our community. And nothing makes a community like local sports. Join the Sporting KC and NASCAR. We're especially pleased to welcome Kansas City Monarchs Baseball and KC Women's National Soccer. Kansas City Scores! We're on a roll that just won't stop. Our next destination, a future drive to expand public safety, improved infrastructure, and the spectacular redevelopment of the Rock Island Bridge into a multifaceted destination venue. Connecting Kansas City's Kansas and Missouri with walking and cycling trails, restaurants, coffee shops, Riverside Parkways, and more. 
I want to welcome you to the Rock Island Bridge. This is a bridge from our past, but it's a bridge to the future. This is an example of how Kansas City, Kansas, why that county, take what is given to us and we transform it and make it into something special. That's the story of why that county, that's the story of Kansas City, Kansas. Thank you. Well, we created that video um, with the mayor for the state of the government. And really it's one of those things we get out and I don't think it's been shown much in a group or any time since then we posted on our website, but I really think it's a good, good one. Let's run through a lot of facts and figures so I don't have to do that today, but um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, when Bill was going through the introduction of me, um, he did forget that Prior to my other job, I worked as a farm hand on my brother's farm. So I <laughs> think otherwise pretty much covered everything in that whole list. Joy have asked me if I'd worked at McDonald's. So I had to throw actually what I did before that. Um, as we go through, you know, I think right after I came in as county administrator, I was given the opportunity to come in and, and speak to congressional forums. So at that time it was done down downtown in the old Reardon Center. So we were able to work through it at that point. I remember after that, that Bill looked to me and said, hey, you know, we'll get you back into this. So now just seven years later, I came right back. And <laughs> forgot how well I did, huh? Yeah, right. yeah, or didn't do. I guess as you looked around, you know, you noticed when the notice went out and said, hey, we're bringing in the chief bureaucrat for uh, Wyandotte County. Nothing packs the room any better, huh? <laughs> Uh, I'll try to make it keep going through here, but last night I um, introduced my budget to the Unified Government Commission, uh, which is always a challenge. I will say that's one of the tasks as a county administrator, city manager for a government. The number one thing you're charged with is going through and working through what is going to be the budget and building something for your governing body to work with based on the policy that they have. So for me, it's always a big lift off my shoulders to get to that, though I know we're the next of the course month, next month while we go through it with the governing body to figure out, get it into final stages for adoption. Um, that's the next lift we'll get to. One of my commissioners here today, and I, I know she'll be fully invested in that, but it's also one where we spend most of the year working on it throughout the course of the year. No questions, you had them last night. <laughs> Just a little over 900. So it's enough to uh, yeah, jump in and read through. You know, for me, for uh, operationally, this has really been the most challenging year of my career. And as Bill noted, I've been with the government for over 30 years. I've been 20 years working in the uh, county administrator's office, never really, faced anything quite like we did with COVID. I mean, that was something that came at us. Well, we started to think ahead and had some idea, oh, this is gonna impact this in a way, no idea. No idea about how that would change the way we would work with the community, work with everyone. And I will say we were a community that has not given the attention to our health department and the way we provide services to our community in the way we should have in past years. Uh, we've had a focus there. We've talked about it. We've tried to do initiatives to, to do more for um, our underserved population, but really hadn't met that challenge. And I think it was with COVID as it came about that it really highlighted that for us, that that was something that we had to, to step up. And, and I will say we did. We have gone out and started to work in, in areas of the community we have been able to touch before. You know, thanks large part to federal money that came in for us to work with last year with CARES money and then this year with some of the ARPA money that's coming in and to our own commission that's allowed us to move money over into that area. You know, we've hired a lot more staff to work in this area than we, we ever had before. So we can go out and we can go into areas where we haven't been able to make inroads in the past. But it's not just the underserved population, it's serving everybody and making sure we're providing that service and coming forward with, I think, what were some of the state of the art facilities in our area. You know, we had our, our congressmen, senators touring our facility early on where we did our testing 
and then delivered our shots because we were able to put something together there quickly that was able to efficiently serve everyone. And then we did satellite facilities and we continue to go out and do mobile startups. And, you know, just uh, earlier this week, we were talking with uh, Hollywood Casino about coming out and doing an opportunity on their, on their site to provide the vaccine. So it's continuing to make those relationships, partnerships with the uh, different community partners we have. They're the ones that deliver a lot of the services. They're the ones that are able to help a lot of people. And, and our job sometimes is just making sure they have the right resources uh, to advance forward with that. But that's, that was a challenge from that side. Operationally with their own government, it was a huge challenge. You know, it was one that, and you know, people will ask me the question frequently, oh, did you guys back open up, you know, as we went through the year and stuff. It's like, well, yeah, we did close our doors to city hall. So we didn't conduct business out the front door. But there was really never a time that 70% of my staff wasn't coming to their office every day. And that's largely, think about it, you're driving a police car and fire trucks and your parks. You know, I got to have the guys down there when you push that little handle in that small room in your house, make sure it's flowing somewhere at the other end. So those guys don't stay home. They have to go into work every day and make sure everything's going. So well, we did have some people from our office side not in. Uh, there was never a day going that we shut down anything from what we did from a government perspective. Even though decisions were made as we went through the year to say, okay, businesses had to close down and those were decisions made by our health, health doctor, you know, and think through it. But I will say that's one that, <clears throat> I don't know what people think sometime when they have the conversation, they kind of go, yeah, how do you guys hit those decisions? Um, you know, I kind of grew up more in the economic development side as I came into administration. So it was all about figuring out how to generate more in economic sales tax and how we do from a development world in that regard. And when we sit down at a table and had a conversation when somebody's going, yeah, I think we need to close down businesses for a while. It's kind of like, what? You know, that it just countered everything I've heard, let alone the private sector to where you're going and what you want to do. But those decisions were made. Thank you. I mean, they were tough decisions and we had to live with them and, and work through it. And now we're back in a position this year where I, I know as we look forward, I don't think there's any intention or thoughts that we have to go that direction. We feel strong about how we're going to be able to, to move forward from here. Um, from that, now we're ready. As I put the budget forward last night, I think some of the big things we're looking at is continuing our fight on blight. You know, just what we're going to do in that regard. Uh, we'd started that being much more intensive about that in previous years. Now we're really uh, getting into a place where we're uh, back where we were. We're able to hire the staff, put people back in, but we've kind of shut down on what we were doing with mowing, cut, shut down on many things we were able to do in infrastructure last year. So we're putting all that back in place. Infrastructure is a key one for our governing body. We're underfunded in that area, so it's an area of focus for us, and we're going to put more resources to it. There's a lot of money in this budget that goes to it. Not enough to do what we need to do, but it will continue to be a, a major focus for us. And in order to do that, we got to keep our workforce. I think everybody in this room understands what it's like to, uh, to hire in today's world. Um, I'm well over 300 employees down from where we are when we're fully staffed, we're, we run a little over 2000. So last year intentionally held back. Um, and then we started to fill positions, but with the dynamics of trying to bring people in, and I will say we're behind where we need to be on the salary curve in a lot of positions. So that's a challenge we're gonna work through in this coming year to figure out how to staff back up many positions or redirect some of them. Probably we'll have some we will never fill just because as you go through it, you learn different priorities and we make sure we're focusing toward what those priorities are. So that's a change for us and the culture of what we're working in and, and how our employees expect to come to work and look at it. So we're, we're looking at different solutions in that regard. The other big area we're working on is infill housing. You know, in the areas where we have infrastructure, that's very important that we continue to figure out how we fill that in. We have more interest now from developers that are looking into the urban core that 
previously had not been there. And I will say, I'll, I'll characterize that similar to like when we started out here in the Village West area, no developer wanted to talk to us about doing anything out here. And for some people that weren't around don't realize how true that was, but that was, it was not a conversation of saying, hey, which one of these guys do we want to pick and work to do this? It was trying to get somebody to have the conversation. And then once we had success here, we were able to build on that and change as we went downtown. Now that momentum's starting to be there in the, in the urban areas. And I will say some of that, I'll liken back to some of the changes that we, we did about six years ago, as a community, we made a decision, we'd start to buy some houses. For years, we've bought lots, vacant lots, we put them in our land bank, we hold them and we own about 5,000 lots today. We're a big landowner from that perspective because they just go through tax sale, what could you do with them? But we didn't take on any properties. We made that decision to say, okay, we're gonna take this. I remember taking that to the governing body and saying, it's gonna be a risk, we're gonna own houses and I don't know what we may do with them or just nobody may be interested. But we sold them out to rehabbers, got them in, they did it, turned those properties. And with that established that there is a real market in the urban area. And now the private sector is coming in and saying they saw those houses sell, something that was falling down on a block. It was a liability for us. It would, if our previous actions would have been just let it keep falling until we have to go in and demo it. Now, over that course of that five years, we've had 78 houses. It doesn't seem like a lot in the big picture, but it's enough to establish a present for the private sector community to go, so they took a property that was falling apart and now this guy rehabbed it and sold it for anywhere from 75 to 150,000. Actually, we had one sell for over 200, you know? So it established there is a real market. And when you establish there's a real market, then the private sector decides to jump in and start working with it. So we saw that happen. Those, seven, those 78 properties are valued at 4.75 million today. That's money that now they're active tax paying properties that before, like I said, were a liability. And actually since the beginning of 2020, we have sold, and I'll use that term lightly in our land bank because our land bank deals are typically like from $100 to $1,000 to somebody. Commercial properties that are planned for either commercial or residential growth with the projection on it that they would put in about $26 million worth on those properties just since the beginning of 2020. So that all happened during the year of COVID and then what's come into this year. And I think, I think just to hit that point, COVID, COVID, was, COVID was a tough year on us for what happened, but in terms of development and we've shown the term out there, that billion dollars, well, that's about what we did last year. And there were a lot of uh, big projects that came in. It was an exciting year in terms of development as to what got announced. You know, we have uh, urban outfitters that came in a little west here, get the highlights, redeveloping of the Woodlands area. Um, trying to think, oh, home field sports, which is getting a, a lot of attention from that perspective of, of what's coming in. But again, on the urban side of that equation, east of 635, we had several different projects come in there as well. I mean, that's where we had the Merck grocery store. I mean, you saw some of these in the video, but at first grocery store downtown to that area to get further in. Um, Donnelly College was in the video right on 18th Street. So reinvestment by others coming in that group. Uh, I, I like seeing the small businesses that were shown in the film, Split Log Coffee and Slaps Barbecue. Both have been very successful down on Central Avenue, both expanded. Central Avenue, Edgar is looking great. That is one of the hottest areas we have going in our community right now. And I think, you know, probably a little hotter on the Eastern side than the Western side, but I mean, it's, it's thriving all up and down that area. And we're seeing a lot of interest of others wanting to come in and do larger projects in association around there. And we have vacant ground around there or projects that are ready to be redeveloped. Uh, you know, Menards out here is thriving in the Western area. They push through their development to do one in the Southeast corner of the community that'll be going under construction later this year along 18th and I-35. So it kind of hits it from a, a different perspective of retail that we haven't seen. And then in terms of apartments, you know, the eastern part of our community really just had not seen it. Of course, 
actually the apartments that built out here in the western area were the first new apartments we've had in 30 years that had built up in why not or in kansas city kansas i don't want to say why not county because we had some bonner come in um, but they were the first ones there um, i know you guys are edwardsville but you're close <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, but Boulevard Lofts down at 9th and Washington, YMCA is being renovated to turn that into an apartment complex there off 8th Street. Um, Willie Lanier is doing an apartment complex on the old Reardon Center site, along with the new Reardon Event Center. And then we've had the Yards 2 announced in the bottoms area. So Yards 1 is in Missouri, if you're not familiar with it. Nice upscale apartments that are building there. But then you move straight across the straight line and they're going to build yards too. And it, while it's not under construction, they're very bullish on when they're going. They've already come to us and started having a conversation about yards three and which will be on the Kansas side as well. So we're feeling really good about that and what's going to happen in retail. And then right near by that on the Eastern side, you saw everything about the Rock Island Bridge. That's a fun project. That's going to be a new destination area that comes in that people are going to be able to get out there walk across that bridge, go in, they'll have event space, they'll have restaurants. It's gonna be exciting for everyone to see and deal with. I think they'll get through their fundraising and then next year we'll start to see things moving forward in that regard. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a snapshot of what's happened from a, a few things on the operational side, what comes into it from a development, which people always ask me the questions about, but I'll say the other big thing I do is I hire people. And I hire good people and that's that makes me look better. So my emphasis is always working to put them in. In just the last few months, I brought in a new chief of police, Carl Oakman. So if you've seen him, he's done a fantastic job since he's come on board in June. So I've really been very excited about him. Uh, we appointed a new appraiser, which is very near and dear to the hearts of many people and knowing how their property is going to be valued. So Matt Willard was put in place here at the end of July challenging job, but I have high expectations of him. He's one we brought into the organization about in 2006, and he's moved through it up to deputy, has a great skill set, so I feel, really feel strong about Matt. Um, new parks director appointed this Monday, Angel Obert. Uh, she's been with us just a couple of years, uh, but she's come in a lot of passion for what's going on in, the, in our community, a lot of passion for kids and how they are. And yesterday I announced the official appointment of one of my assistant county administrators, Bridget Cobbins. Uh, Bridget is an example of someone that came into our organization, I guess similar to like me, but she started prior to her degree as a data entry clerk and worked her way through our organization, got her degrees all the way up. And I put her in as an interim earlier in this year and she has been kicking butt and I just made it official with her this week. So that's my recap or my statement what's going on and i'm happy to take any questions that you all have I might have to take my coat off though i'm sweating up here yeah. Yeah. it is warm yeah. Yeah, I think, so the question was, what's is the status of the Reardon Center and, and going on from that perspective? And I think you guys did actually quit meeting there well before that. The, I mean, that's been years. You've been out here for three, four years at least. Yeah, so last year we announced that project to move, to move forward. Uh, we did shut it down in relationship to COVID, but then we thought uh, Willie Lanier was gonna start moving forward a little earlier on the project. Um, We've had to go through and just tweak a couple of things with his development agreement in order, we think, to make it work. That's advancing. It's already been to our Economic Development Standing Committee, so it should advance out to our full commission later this, um, yeah, next week. So I think that'll give us the final touches. In my last conversations with Willie, he felt very confident about taking the next step and um, getting a thing under construction this year. Or probably be on the demo side this year. And that'll be an apartment complex. And then it'll be a new meeting event center that'll be built with it as well. Okay. There. I hate to throw uh, this out there, but, and this is not intended to be a softball, but uh, we're in the, the age of, of election time and, and it's 
drag down all those people who lower my tax, lower my tax. But by the way, fix my road. Yeah. What does a meal cost you if you drop your budget? All right. That's a great question. So the question is really related to a mill, which in many people's terms and residents, Mayor, I know you know it, but most people have no idea what you're talking about when you start talking about a, a mill. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. And that's a, it's a good thing. So when you look at it from a, from a mill and having just present the budget, um, we're a city and a county. So a mill is how we collect our taxes based on the valuation of, of the property. And county is a little different than what a mill comes in for a city. So a mill for me, if I get it on the county side, is worth about $1.4 million. On the city side, it's worth a little over $1.2 million. To break that down a little bit further, if I say you're a resident and your house is worth $200,000, that means you'll pay $23 for a mill. So per year. Per year. Yeah, that's not a monthly thing. That's $23 that somebody pays per year. So if I if we go and you get that lower your taxes, how many mills do you need to take off before somebody actually recognizes it? You know, I mean, sure we'd all like to have $23. I kind of you point that. And for a business, if you're a half million dollar business, that's about $125. You know, they don't correlate the same because your valuation is different between commercial and residential. But so if it's a half million dollar business, it's $125. If it's a $200,000 house, it's $23. So if you're a $100,000 house, you're $1,150. If you're a $400,000 house, it's $46 a year. I probably would argue that it takes a few mills before it really makes an impact on somebody's place. But a few mills for me off my operating budget for every mill, I can pave 10 lane miles, reconstruct 10 lane miles. I don't spend $1.2 million on my entire code enforcement division. So when I say, let's go after our attack on blight and in that area, I drop a mill, that's the equivalent of me dropping my entire team that works on that. So 14 police officers, that's another one that falls in line for that regard. So. Good question. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, well, <laughs> and like I said, I, we deal with this annually, and, and it's meant to be harder during these election times because that's the rhetoric that gets spewed out. Yeah. I lower my taxes. Well, what, in my situation in Edwardsville, lowering a mill would cost me $17 a year. I don't need that $17. Yeah, that's right. It's the, the city, though, on the other hand, needs the 82000 yeah, it's a different balance. Yeah. Good point. Bill? Uh, yeah, Doug, you mentioned uh, housing, community housing, Wyandotte County. I know they've been doing anywhere from 20 to 30 homes a year. And they've been going into areas where they've worked with you, obviously, where you've made some practically all city blocks. They also have started to move out west. Is there any thought mm -hmm. to, try, I hate to say word subsidize, but to get these uh, builders to come in, more of them to build these? I think one of the problems for community housing has been, they don't have enough product. They got people waiting in line that have the money. That's what I've been told. I, I helped them uh, personally, but I, I, I do believe though that a, a lot of the incentives, for instance, on elect, electricity, within three or four years, you get all your money back if you can get this house and get it built and get it occupied. If you've got a lot of uh, folks here that are looking for homes. I know it's probably a discussion that comes up, but I'm glad to hear you got 78, but God, it'd be great if we could get another 20 homes or 30 homes until a year. We have some way to uh, incentivize some of the builders to build these homes. Just, just thought. Yeah, that's a good question, Bill. And it's one uh, Mayor Alvey has been pushing us really hard on really since he's been in, but it's one that's coming more to uh, realization, I think this year. I'll just note a couple of things going on. I mean, one is we went through close to a hundred properties for housing. Right. So that emphasis is there, but also having a conversation about what can be done to increase incentives that go to builders. Uh, we're working toward a, a workshop to try to bring in builders, get additional input, 
but a few things that are out there. One, the Board of Public Utilities has already moved forward and said for everybody that builds on our land bank lots east of 78th Street, they're gonna provide free hookup for their water and electricity. So those are a couple of big costs that new houses come in. Um, I think we're going to advance, I don't know what, I think we'll advance it at our next standing committee in September, a similar thing for uh, unified government, um, like our wastewater uh, fees. So they'd come in, so we'd have free hookup from that side of it. So that lowers that cost, that initial upfront. I mean, combined, those probably add up close to $5,000. I mean, total of what's coming in that somebody has to spend on a new house. And one of the reasons you look at that and the other other big thing we're looking at is in many of the lots you try to develop in the urban area, when it was demoed, you're a little uncertain as to what's under the ground. Pre-95, our rules were far less stringent than they are today. So everything since then, we're pretty confident. You made them throw it in the back of the truck and they hauled it off and properly disposed of it. Many things that were disposed of before 1995, you dug the hole, and buried it underneath there. So when a new builder comes in, you know, you're pulling up stuff, you can have asbestos things in there, you got to dig it out. Plus, not all the shutoffs were done right. So the infrastructure in the ground is more challenging up and down there. So eliminating some of those fees, one of the thing we were, uh, I know Representative Curtis with the for state is looking at some other types of things that we think we might be able to do and put in place with uh, some bills that were done for um, rural areas in Kansas that we think we might be able to bring those into some of the urban areas and, and have the same type of incentives we can do towards some of these retail housing. So potentials there. And then additionally, you know, maybe it's a fund or something that's just there because when somebody hits a lot and it's an unknown, that we, we take it from a perspective of saying that this can help somebody up to a certain amount when you get into it and try to make it a little bit more like green space when you start in. So good points are, yeah, our goal is not 20 or 30 a year. Our goal is to get closer to a thousand a year coming in and start filling these up because we have the roads, the utility company has the power lines and water and stuff all running around these areas. But when you go for blocks and blocks and you have one house here and one house there, uh, that's where we need to focus on development and bring it up to a higher and better use. Doug, I think you'll have an advantage. I know Edwardsville uh, out there, not Edwardsville, Kirby, uh, south of Oak Lake, but, uh, you know, their area, uh, where, where they have general yeah. They're charging $8,000 for a hookup south there for homes. Right. So that's kind of the thing that you need to let builders know that, hey, you got a better deal because you're talking 8000 out there right now for a hookup. Merle? Yes. I noticed from UGTV that the budget for 2022 is $403 million. $423. $423. Yeah. Well, we all, <laughs> 20 our, year, 20 year. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Well, you're, you're right on the number. Our revenue projection for next year is 403 we are expending some money that because we brought in more revenues this year than anticipated so we put some of that toward capital and that'll go out next year so what are your expenditures for the rest of this the total for 2020 um i don't know that i can tell you the the narrowed down piece of how much is left to spend this year but we're I think our budget for this year is around, right around 400 million, 490 something, I believe for 2021. Does that include COVID-19? It, it will include some of the, some of the immediate needs type things we've identified through the ARPA money, which is the American Re Rescue Relief Plan. So not very much of it, but there's a little bit of it in this year. Anything you can do to stabilize property taxes, I'm in favor. <laughs> Appreciate that. And, and you know, when I made my introduction about coming here and getting to be the chief bureaucrat in a county, <laughs> you all will remember this. When he, for probably the first five years I was made into the administrator's office, Merle would call me up, ask me a question, he would go through it, and then he'd write an article. <clears throat> and I would I'd go home and I'd show my sons, I'd say, Hey, look, I'm in the paper. And, and they'd read it and they go, I don't see your name. And go, hey, right here. 
bureaucrats said. Bureaucrats <laughs> at City Hall. <laughs> he didn't give me a name. For, I, I was in there at least five years before I became. Only dealt with the truth. <laughs> <laughs> terms of the number of dollars being invested and talks about downtown and work in Kansas City, Kansas. What's the biggest biggest project that's in the work, single project in terms of dollars invested? Talking about across the entire community? No, northeast side, downtown JCK, the, the single project, total dollars being invested. Hmm. Good question, Dr. Moser. Um, <laughs> Well, probably the well, no, Northeast. I was going to say KU's announced another big building in that area, but that's not over in the Northeast area. Uh, we've got a few that are contemplated right now that I could, I can't give you the. Oh, you're talking about the uh, community college, maybe. Is that where you're going? What might be the $70 million investment? For downtown KCK. That is the biggest one we have. It's the $75 million one getting. I thought you were trying to get me for something else to come no, up with. No, no, you were just here talking just about that. Myself, yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> Threw me that softball. I should have hit it out for you. I apologize for that. Go um, ahead. Chamber of Commerce worked with you on infrastructure, understanding the critical need for infrastructure, especially as we talk about stormwater. I know that's moved along plan that's been developed. Can you talk a little bit about where that is and what we need to do to get that finished? I can. Thank you very much. So stormwater has been an issue for us for a, a number of years in the community. It's a enterprise fund and by an enterprise fund, it's one we look at and say it should be able to sustain itself versus fees that come about for what we need in terms of how we handle our stormwater. Uh, many communities around the area have their own stormwater funds that are self-sustaining. Ours is insolvent. Uh, we have a flat fee today that we charge $4.50, regardless if you're a homeowner on a small house in Strawberry Hill or you're Dr. Moser at the community college and his property or this property that we're sitting on, you pay $4.50. So there's a lot of inequities from that perspective as to what's going in. So we've been working through a permeable surface rate to say, let's, calc let's do a rate calculated based on how much stormwater you create. Um, we haven't come to resolution yet as to how that can be. I have done a slight tweak in the budget that I recommended this, this year. So it doesn't take that next step, but it does just move the, the homeowners to $6 and then it moves businesses to $14. So it just kind of separates the two different categories. I don't think we're gonna get a lot of resistance in that regard. The one is as it moves over to the permeable surface. So we're hoping that our governing body will, and I know there's a lot of them having conversation, they know they wanna get there, that through the end of the year to come up with a, a permeable surface rate that does a calculation based on how much, um, how much concrete and asphalt you have on your property or buildings you have on your property. And then we run the calculation that way. So working through that in the coming months, I know there's been a, a conversation with the chamber about a, a solution from a staff perspective that we seem to be gelling with, I think, as far as what both sides of the equation think that could work. Um, and, and that's really something that we need to have in place by 2023, because right now with the federal money that's out there, much of it takes a local match. So with the dollars, which is a federal loan, type grant, but they let you borrow money and you get it interest-free for a number of years till you go through all the construction side of it. And then as we apply for other grant money, if we actually have money to work with, we can leverage their money. But if I have, without any change to my rate structure, because we, we spend everything we have, because we have something that fails to have it, I'd have about $800,000 in next year's budget. And I don't have five million. We're taking that from the general fund, and it'll move over to the property tax side. That's correct. We hope that okay. if all of those solutions that you are contemplating for the runoffs that you have shown, there is a lot of respect for small business owners, the small, uh, you know, single dwellings, family owners that should not pay more than the rich, the large owners of large structural parking, et cetera, et cetera. 
So that has been the case for many times, and it's still there. I understood, Edgar, and I think that's something we're going to try to work with to keep in the balance of that a small business owner has to. I think some of the things that came out of the formulas that were corrected probably took too much off of the, the bigger businesses. So it's keeping that keeping that balance in place. All right, I think I've got the hook. So I don't know if I'll still be doing this job seven years from now when you give me a call. So <laughs> good to see y'all. But Bill will still be here. I want one more round of applause for Doug's willingness to come here and submit himself to this kind of abuse. <laughs> okay, our next meeting is Friday, September 17, here at 11.30. We're done. All right.